How easy is it for us to fall prey to cultism? How easy is it for Americans to go down a rabbit hole? And how long would it take to brainwash someone into a certain way of thinking? Throughout the course of this season of overthinking everything, I've been making some claims on the deliberate dumbing down and numbing down of America. While information has never been easier to obtain, America's complacent culture of overblown, narcissistic, Dunning-Kruger, know-nothing, know-it-alls won't stop binging the office for the 14th time to look for those answers to the questions they keep asking incessantly, almost rhetorically it seems. Earlier this season, with an episode titled The New World Order of Ethical Ambiguity, I laid forth a point that not only was it the 90s when it all went to hell for American ethical standards, but that professional wrestling, reality television, and infotainment were at the center of it. My argument was the principle of kayfabe, the insistence that what happens in the pro wrestling storyline is sacred and you stick to the story, in and out of the ring, no matter what. It's real and your life depends on it. You're playing a role. You're not Mark Calloway or Glenn Jacobs. They're paying you not to be those boring ass normal people. They're paying you for The Undertaker and Kane. As our information, news, entertainment, and all media in the digital age has morphed into this warped caricature kaleidoscope of homogenous, watered-down infotainment, blurring the lines of reality even further, bringing kayfabe out of just wrestling but into our pop culture, Americans, well, humans really, struggle with the dissolution of the fourth wall. This episode isn't about professional wrestling. It's more about my current and deliberate obsession with professional wrestling. I'm not a fan of professional wrestling, let me explain. It's about how my focus on Vince McMahon's influence in this dehumanizing and desensitizing of American culture has led me to some shocking conclusions. Among those, that even I am vulnerable to cultism. And that just by doing some research, simple research on a topic, it's made a big chunk of my life about professional wrestling whether I really wanted it or not. What I discovered goes beyond just wrestling, though. You see, I don't really like wrestling. I don't really like much of anything anymore. The stoicism and a journey of deconstructing has sort of had me questioning many of the attachments I've formed throughout my life. As I started to discover that the inclusion of Vince McMahon in my unholy trinity with Rupert Murdoch and Donald Trump wasn't just tongue-in-cheek for entertainment purposes only, but a darker and more sinister correlation, I began to explore my own journey as a young man growing up the way I did and how the entertainment choices I made or that were made for me impacted my personality and my life. In this episode, The Algorithm Method, I'm breaking down how quickly it took my precious algorithm, which I had carefully cultivated over years, watching what I clicked on, subscribed to, and <sighs> to be overrun with cultist brainwashing. The seemingly harmless, of course. My precious algorithm? It's responding to things I'm searching for, reading about, seemingly showing interest in. So it tries to accommodate and push more of that. But it gets greedy, knows no nuance, and takes nothing into consideration except feeding you more so you will feed it more. If you think that sounds whackers, then just wait until you hear how easy it happened and how long it didn't take to completely dominate my news feed with <clears throat> professional wrestling. And welcome to the podcast. <laughs> First off, I respect and admire athletes in any sport. Look at me. Even in my prime, running from the cops or bullies, same thing, was the extent of my exertion. Athletes push their bodies and have something that most people don't. Amateur athletes push to get to the top. Pros push harder to stay there. Professional wrestling is different in that there isn't a high school, college, or trade school circuit. It's a learn the basics of whichever style and then hit the amateur circuit and destroy your body for years hoping you have whatever it takes to be noticed and hope you don't die before you're 45. It isn't a lot different than radio, television, or social media in that regard. You just get your ass kicked more. A lot more. 
in your underwear, usually covered in oil. Well, sometimes that happens in media too, but bygones. <clears throat> All jokes and jabs aside, the athletes, entertainers, and superstars of professional wrestling deserve credit for the show that they put on. While some of those behind the scenes may be corrupt and pro wrestlers don't really have a history of being angels, these are entertainers who train, then choreograph these complex maneuvers so as not to accidentally or recklessly Bill Goldberg somebody, or inadvertently end their own careers or Owen Hart. There are many unspoken rules of wrestling, kayfabe, which we will discuss at length here, but also protect your partner. For entertainment purposes only, they are your opponent in the ring when the cameras are rolling. But they're also your partners. Your job in super kicking their jaw is to make sure you don't break their jaw, snap their neck, or do any level of serious damage an actual connected high kick to the face could do. <laughs> Look, for all the face slams into whatever a face can slam into, how many of these people are missing teeth? That is the carefully choreographed chaos of kayfabe. Wrestling's fake. It's a phrase I've heard used all too often by people who have watched it, but have never stepped foot in a ring. Or maybe they never even watched it, for that matter. It's not fake. It's choreographed. It's planned and predetermined. There are a few surprises. The matches are timed for television. They keep it around 15 or 20. Wrestler A is going to do their finisher twice. Wrestler B kicks out. Wrestler B comes back. will win. The filler stuff in the match might be improv in the moment, but... All those moves are carefully practiced, rehearsed, and professionally choreographed in private gyms behind closed doors. Especially those where they're jumping out of the ring onto a group of people. But the story is fake as hell. So scripted programming is. Unscripted programming is. It's all fake. The acting in wrestling is usually pretty bad, which should be the telltale that it's for entertainment purposes only. This isn't Dame Judi Dench and Sir Laurence Olivier doing a backstage promo, but the physicality, unmatched. MMA doesn't choreograph. Football, football, basketball, hockey, none of them train the way wrestlers do. So, respect on their craft. I acknowledge them. All that aside, the principle of kayfabe is one that has seeped out into the world around us like a toxic waste improperly disposed of. From wrestling, we saw entertainment adopt and embrace kayfabe. Hollywood always has, really. It's play nice for the camera, stay in that loveless marriage because divorces are tabloid fodder and your ratings will go down. It's hide in the closet because America wants a sexy sweetheart girl next door. If they can't have sex with you, they won't want to watch you. Kayfabe is the big old lie you tell your audience to convince them that everything they're watching is genuine, real, and should be believed. It goes beyond suspension of disbelief. It's, this is real by God. Professional wrestling still embraces that to some degree, but for today, that for entertainment purposes only part is a little more on the face, thanks to that 24-7 news cycle and the rise of the internet and social media. In press conferences, podcasts, and interviews, the curtain is pulled back just a little bit. The stars discuss their stories. They even use the word storyline. <laughs> it's fascinating to see this trend in this sport. But as we explore the effects of kayfabe, let me put a finer point on the statement, everybody knows it's fake. While this might be true, it's always been taken for granted in our culture in that you, you just don't see many tabloids or gossip columns with the headlines, The Undertaker Exposed as Mark Calloway Dines Out with His Family. Nobody cares that Mark Calloway is The Undertaker or plays The Undertaker, or that Mark Calloway doesn't really have some chubby little creepy dude following him around with an urn. It's almost like everybody knows it's an act, but everybody just sort of also turns a respectful blind eye to the kayfabe because that's really the only way wrestling has ever worked. Consider if soap operas never rolled credits. What if they sold it to us that we were watching a drama play out, but they insisted the drama was real? Marlena, John Black, Roman Brady, they aren't Deidre Hall, Drake Hogeston, and the revolving door of Romans, but in fact, the show pushes the idea that these actors are their characters and that what's happening that we're seeing on TV is very real. And that's what happened with reality television. Soap operas that embraced kayfabe. 
TV executives looked at days of our lives, one life to live as the world turned to General Hospital and said, hey, what if we did this? But we just took out the demon possessions, kidnappings, and evil villains. Yeah, they kept the affairs, backbiting, scheming, conniving, and complete disregard for ethics in soap characters, but dropped all the overly sensational, unbelievable stuff that made it so obviously fake. With the real world, MTV pushed forth a real-life soap opera that quickly captivated a younger demographic, which had grown up on 24-7 sensationalized infotainment. For the MTV generation, the real world was the natural evolution of entertainment. If my so-called life wasn't real enough for us, then the real world really would be. Except not everyone was prepared for that level of reality in our faces. As I've discussed in previous episodes, psychologically, we are what we consume. And when we consume a diet of junk food with little sustenance, we quickly become junk dudes with little substance. We devolve into superficial emotional service dwellers, putting forth the facade to fool our friends, family, and even foes. We parade around with someone else's ideas, personality, style, mannerisms. We repeat the jokes and parrot the phrases we hear. And quickly, those pop culture catchphrases and memes are all the rage, but do we ever consider why we're so obsessed over something? Anything. <laughs> Today, anything and everything we could ever want is spread out before us on a grand buffet table, and it's all you can consume with no parent there to make sure you're not just sticking your face under the chocolate fountain and calling that dinner. We have a personal, individual responsibility to keep ourselves in check. We have a cultural collective responsibility as well. Why? Because the history of humans shows us that when we, the people, don't check ourselves, a bigger entity, usually a government or a church, will swoop down to ensure we don't wreck ourselves. If we police ourselves, we don't need anyone else to police us. <laughs> Perfect world utopia shit right there, ain't it? Let's get real. Governments exist, entities exist to do one of two things. Control. It's either control for the greater good of the people or control for the exploitation of the people. That comes down to the missing piece of genius level intellect I discussed in the devolution of the Southern Democrat. It's asking a lot of a people to place our trust in any entity because history provides a narrative of the latter more than the former. That's a hard and bitter pill to swallow. We are ultimately responsible for the disasters that are our lives. We are to blame for what we allowed our kids to watch. And our parents and grandparents are to blame for what they didn't know any better than to let us watch at whatever age. Yeah. All that's going down like a pack of saltines after a big old bong rip. If that's not hard enough to choke down, how about coming to terms with the idea that the worst of our natures might just be more natural than any of us are comfortable admitting? That sliding into that darkness is easier and easier and more tempting with the more influence, power, or control over others one or one's group has. The differences among us, if there are any, aren't racial, geographical, spiritual, or anything to do with our private parts and who arouses them. The differences, as I've pointed out, are in empathy, compassion, understanding, perspective, support, and critical thinking. The dumbing down and numbing down of America. So to set a stage with this, professional wrestling's influence on this topic should not be ignored, and by the end of this episode, you'll understand why. Reality television's evolution should be on the table as well. I will touch on those topics, but this episode is more about the algorithms we're beholden to, who controls them, and how we fall prey to them daily. And for this, I used myself as the test subject. I guinea pig my whole feed. When it came to the unholiest of trinities, Rupert Murdoch's impact on society is inarguable, but Donald Trump's too, for that matter. Those would be easy for me to discuss. But who else could really be to blame for this dumbing down and numbing down of America? That's when I began looking more into the 80s and 90s and Reagan's deregulation of media. I started exploring more in depth about Vince McMahon's cultural footprint. I started this chicken and egging of the hypothesis, did art imitate life or did life imitate art? And the conclusion, spoilers, is that it's sort of cyclical. 
What happened was this art of professional wrestling, thanks to Vince McMahon, exploited life through some sociopathic egomaniac's caricature imitation, and then life imitated that art. The prime case, for example, is Donald Trump. Donald Trump has been Donald Trump since before the bone spurs, but it was his appearance in a WWE storyline in 2007 that put his brash, bulwaristic boardroom style on full display for a different audience than The Apprentice. Let's give some historical context first. Trump's primetime business boardroom competition show premiered on January 8, 2004. Nine weeks later, Trump would be on professional sports' biggest stage, being interviewed by Jesse the Body Ventura, former gender non-conforming wrestler and Minnesota governor. When at the end of the interview, Ventura suggested he might get back into the ring of politics. He asked for Trump's support, and Trump verbally gave it on camera. Then Ventura made a remark about, uh, maybe we need a wrestler in the White House in 2008. He was talking about himself as he usually did. This was in 2004. One might think Ventura gave Don the idea. He did, but four years prior, Trump and Ventura go way back too. Wrestling Inc. reports the two were at the core of the dismantling of Ross Perot's Reform Party, a party my very complicated Southern Democrat father bandwagoned early. Jesse Ventura pushed Trump to run in 2000, something many f people forget. Many also forget Trump at WrestleMania 20 because it wasn't a very long appearance and it was a very self-serving piece for Ventura and Trump both. Or maybe for the same reason one can't purchase the Apprentice box set on DVD. There's more to this I'll cover later this season with Ross Perot. It's pivotal to explaining Trump's rise. Donald Trump was always a cartoon character. Vince McMahon's manipulative Midas touch thrust Trump into the stratosphere of pop culture in a way he wasn't already, normalizing this obnoxious, eccentric, problematic elite snob. Trump had an extensive relationship with Vince McMahon long before Jesse Ventura interviewed Trump at WrestleMania 20 in 2004. Trump's properties had hosted many pro boxing and fighting events before, including WrestleManias 4 and 5 in the late 1980s. Of course, he was ringside and interviewed on camera. Trump never misses a mug. Donald Trump's influence on those two events set the standard for the current event's evolution into a full-on festival-type fanfare, not dissimilar to any other sports championship event. Of this unholiest of trinities, Trump and McMahon Trump and McMahon are the Dorothy and Rose. Murdoch's Blanche, believe it or not. Only because he's the one that owns the house. That's right, there's Reagan as Sophia. But this battle of the billionaire storyline from 2007 set Trump on center ring on the biggest stage in professional sports. Here was the real estate mogul up against the sports entertainment mogul in a loser gets their head shaved match. Bobby Lashley, the almighty Virgil for Trump, while Umaga did the heavy lifting for McMahon in the ring. Spoilers, Vince lost the match and his rug. Creating the Donald Trump WWE character was an easy job for McMahon. Like I said, Trump was Trump from the start. He clocked in, in character. The clay was uh, corrupted before the molding began. But this character was nothing new. Donald Trump was a trope, a stereotype of himself a living, breathing caricature. Vince McMahon had basically created this character in the ring before. Donald Trump was the Million Dollar Man. In the 1980s and 90s, while WWE Hall of Famer Ted DiBiase proudly paraded around the ring in his Million Dollar Belt and Glitter Tuxedo, other wrestlers would be bought off to take a dive or turn on their partners. Not behind the scenes, on TV for everyone to see. When DiBiase put an opponent nighty night in his million dollar dream sleeper hold, the million dollar heel would order his African American non consensual indentured servant Virgil to stuff hundred dollar bills in their unconscious mouths. DiBiase would pay off refs, he would humiliate fans, bully them, and act like he was better than everybody else. Everybody had a price, everybody was gonna pay. It was almost like DiBiase was based off Trump. In fact, he was, undoubtedly. So the story goes, according to DiBiase, when he appeared on Stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw, McMahon wanted DiBiase to be the stuck-up rich bully everybody can't stand. Ted DiBiase was an accomplished wrestler and wrestling promoter in his own right. 
when Vince McMahon had the idea for his Million Dollar Man character, DiBiase says Vince spared no expense selling the kayfabe that DiBiase was wealthier than anyone around him. Let me make this clearer from a business and workplace perspective. Everyone else in the back then WWF had contracts and paychecks, all that stuff, like work. But DiBiase had that and a corporate expense account on top of that just because his character was supposed to be wealthy beyond compare and had to act like it, even when he wasn't in the ring. Kayfabe. Limos, guards, private catering, the finest hotels. DiBiase would go into a restaurant, buy everybody's dinner, and Vince had a guy always go with Ted to take care of the expenses. Image was everything. And with the Million Dollar Man, there was no price too high that Vince McMahon wouldn't pay to buy the audience's belief. This wasn't just the case with DiBiase, but this is certainly a great example of the extent some will go just to uphold the lies of kayfabe. I saw a clickbait article a while back that said 10 professional wrestlers who would be canceled today or something along those lines. These were over-the-top, exaggerated caricatures of stereotypes. I covered some of these toxic portrayals in previous episodes, but when I saw the headline, I remembered off the top of my head dozens of problematic characters in and out of the ring. This was just a fluff article in my news app. One of those fun little time wasters or toilet reads. I rarely click on these because I understand how algorithms work. In this news app, I had customized which sources, what types of news I was interested in seeing. I'm very protective of this algorithm. So, of course, I clicked it. I mean, nostalgia, right? <laughs> nostalgia, indeed. I found a few on the list I remembered, a couple I didn't even know about. And, of course, as the internet internets, I went down a rabbit hole. Of nostalgic research for the show, honestly. I remembered many moments from wrestling growing up that were cringy. Also, full disclosure, former wrestler Kane Glenn Jacobs retired and became county mayor of Knox County, Tennessee, my stomping grounds. He's a fascist and a hypocrite. For all his inhumane policies, he's only relevant for profiting off the exploitation of others. So maybe when I started exploring wrestling's cultural impact, I went in with a chip. It isn't that chip's fault that I stumbled into a break. Moments in Kane's career alone were alarmingly disturbing. I missed all that because I stopped watching wrestling after I had sex with someone besides myself. I started my research by looking back around just before I remembered starting to watch wrestling or being aware of wrestling. In reality, I think I might have been into pro wrestling for a total of six years, tops. Still, the late 80s to early 90s was a great little sample. A while back, when I chose to take on this topic to research for the show, I went with what was easy to digest for me since I didn't have much patience for that sort of programming anymore. My choice was the Royal Rumble. Now, this was a pay-per-view premium event held once a year where the main event was 30 wrestlers in an over-the-top rope elimination match. I usually don't know who all was involved, so it's surprise, surprise. Two wrestlers start. They had another every few minutes till the last one standing. Even though now I know the winner was always predetermined, but boy, it's still fun to watch. But these events had more than just the Rumble match. There were title bouts and rivalry matches, too. It was an hours-long event. The more I watched and noted the problem... The more I watched and noted the problematic plots, the toxic tropes, the testosterone-juiced jabs and jokes at others' expenses, I noted the feelings and memories that came from this period of my life. I remember taking old mattresses and trying to create a makeshift ring in my basement for me and my friends to practice moves on each other. We practiced the voices, the promos. We all kind of got into it for a while. Of course, then we grew up. But video games and weekly programs would get the guys to come over and watch. I even went so far as to create a role-playing game. One of those you see in the game stores where you roll the dice and you have all these character cards and teams and... I didn't sell it or anything. But by the time I finished creating it, me and my friends were we were kind of over wrestling for the most part. It wasn't cool. All these memories, though, started flooding in. The more Royal Rumbles I watched, the more I remembered. 
it hit me that I had downloaded a wrestling game on my Xbox a few years ago because it was included as a free download or something. So I fired that up one day just to play a Royal Rumble, of course, and to see who all they had in the game that I might remember. Well, that led to me thinking, if the football and basketball games today have downloadable rosters and rookies people just sit at home and build, you know, just to do it, then I wonder if, or just maybe in this video game. Well, not on the older versions. As it turns out, you can't access any of that downloadable content stuff after a while. So I had to buy the newest version and all the downloadable content, but because I wanted all the legends too. And most of the wrestlers I remembered were behind a paywall. No biggie. It's all in the name of research, right? I'm writing a book on it, tax deductible. I went down this exploration of all these characters created by players at home, just like me, except I have a life and a career. No, I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding because the skill it takes to do that and the time is just not something I can fathom. But I could download Mr. Perfect, Owen Hart, wrestlers from years ago. that They had literally everybody you could think of. Andy Kaufman. I found myself amused at the distraction. I really wasn't paying a attention to the video game a whole lot at the time, uh, or any other video game at the time, so I, I had time to dive in. Maybe it'd be a good time waster. I needed something besides this, something where I could turn my brain off and stop overthinking everything. Once you get the game set up, you can create tag team stables and alliances, rivalries. It's pretty in-depth. So in what little spare time I had, I googled stuff about specific wrestlers. I explored more of those clickbaity articles to jar my memories. I watched old wrestling episodes. I looked up who was in what tag teams with whom. And I started watching what was currently on television, just a little, you know, just for modern context. In wrestling, I'm what's called a mark. I'm someone in the crowd that's smart enough to see beyond the facade of kayfabe, but also not the kind of dick to blow it for everybody else either. Someone like me, the wrestlers might interact with a little, knowing I might be fun and play along rather than giving up the gag. I learned all kinds of terminology and facts about wrestling through my research for my New World Order of Ethical Ambiguity episode and the ones after, and the books I'm working on. Admittedly, I wanted to delve into the video game and see what all I could find, but I, I also enjoyed it. I also saw an opportunity for a social experiment. Not knowing much about wrestling post-mid-90s, I relied on my search engine to pull up the many answers to my many questions. There was Edge and Miz, never heard of them. Roman Reigns, never heard of him. Kevin Owens, never heard of him. I knew Cody Rhodes was Dusty's son and Goldust's brother, then I learned he used to be Stardust. That had to be tough. Seth Rollins, AJ Styles, never heard of him. Brock Lesnar, only through the pop culture crossover factor of MMA, of which I am not a fan, but I do get passing references most of the time. I had a lot to catch up on just to play this game, much less to write a book about all of it and incorporate that into my show. Look, when last we left our hero, Triple H was this prissy prance about and floofy ruffled collars and leather pants calling himself Hunter Hearst Helmsley and acting all rich and snooty. I missed pretty much all of the game. And now he's retired and running the show. I missed a lot. I missed like six out of seven of The Undertaker's personalities. I did get to see most of McFoley's though. I'm not rambling. This is all important. For over a quarter century, I've not consumed professional wrestling in any form aside from a wrestler being in another form of entertainment, like a movie. Then one day I decided to write about it. Then it's in my search bar. It's in my algorithm. And the algorithm gets greedy, knows no nuance, and takes nothing into consideration except feeding you so you will feed it more. And feed the algorithm I did. At this point, I began to see more and more and more of these articles popping up. Some were blogs, some were reviews of last night's show. Some were rumors and speculation about what's going to happen in the ring or the writer's room. It was a lot of the clickbait. Video games and console corruption in my experiment were handled with WWE 2K. That's Microsoft, that's Windows. My algorithm is screwed before I start. Through the video game's menu screen, I found some catchy tunes, including Rev Theory's Voices, the theme song for Randy Orton, another wrestler I hadn't heard of, The Game by Motorhead, Triple H's theme song, 
These are rock songs in their own rights, so it isn't like I'm jamming out to Ric Flair, Mr. Perfect, or Macho Man's theme songs of orchestral maneuvers to the ring. I found these entrance themes on YouTube, added them to a playlist, even the karaoke versions, because I like to sing in the shower loudly. Video games, music, covered. Xbox, YouTube, corrupted. Streaming, covered and corrupted. Peacock, home of the WWE. Hulu, home for TV. By this point, I've been watching Royal Rumbles, Survivor Series, and WrestleManias in the background. All the while, of course, my phone microphones are probably on, right? <laughs> Within weeks of my starting the work on my New World Order of Ethical Ambiguity episode, my carefully crafted algorithmic online world was becoming a new order of information offerings and was closing in around me faster than I realized. Wrestling was dominating my periphery. I couldn't escape it. Within a few more weeks, I began seeing more and more and more of the notifications across my phone go from three random stories, usually political, to at least one of them being about wrestling. More and more and more news updates began popping up on my phone from apps I hadn't used at all that much for news. It seemed like they liked to talk around the social media water cooler. Oh, Josh Brandon? Oh, that guy loves wrestling. Really? How do you know? Oh, that guy's IP address will click on any and every wrestling article you feed him. He can't get enough. He's a super fan. Oh, well, maybe I should send him a few articles. Oh, well, just don't make it about women's wrestling. He's apparently a sexist. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't give a flip and flop about women's wrestling. And it isn't sexism. I love women's basketball. I enjoy watching women excel and succeed. But my experience with women's wrestling was from the 80s when I was surrounded by sexist ideals or later in the 90s when women's wrestling was reduced to glorified bikini-clad mud fights. It was all for sexual arousal and little for the promotion of the sport or those who participated. Low-hanging fruit for the fans. At least that was my impression of women's wrestling. Until now, when I see that the industry has started to take women in the sport more seriously. Those disappointing diva days did lay the foundation for today's less tongue in whatever cheek inclusion, but it's still sexualized, just less than before. Progress, let's say. So I started reading about women wrestlers and that algorithm corrected itself appropriately. Still corrupted, mind you, but at least now women are more represented in my feed. The more I read, the more I got delivered. And before long, almost everything I saw in my newsfeed was somehow tied to wrestling. At very least, 75% of the articles on my main feed in my news app are wrestling, fighting sports, or sports entertainment. Something to note is that since 2020, I haven't been into sports whatsoever. I was once a Tennessee Titans fan. I loved the NBA. I'd enjoy some hockey. Football, though, was my primary sport. I'd watch any game so long as it was a good game. But for over two years, since I began this algorithmic assault, I was disconnected from most things sports. Sorry, sports. Thanks, COVID. I read very few articles about any of it, just for the perspective of the sort of reset my algorithm had gone through leading up to this. I deconstructed a lot of things. Sports just seemed less important to me moving forward. Not to say I won't watch another game or go to a game, but it's nothing I care to follow through any level of cultism. Cultism. So there's the elephant in the room. <laughs> Oof. And here I was about to get trampled by my own experiment. I take pride in staying informed and up-to-date on current events. I carefully craft and massage my news feed's algorithm, deliberate almost, to ensure my feed isn't skewed in a way that makes it more difficult for me to stay informed the way that I demand. I had been getting several alerts a day, fed to me three stories at a time. Most of the time, at least two were quality stories from reputable sources. One might be fluff, entertainment, sports, or something I wasn't really interested in. I don't read every article, but the headlines are a great place for me to filter and decide if I'm interested or have time to start searching for the real story. 
people who see my phone or screenshots I post to social media cringe at my notification bar, but I leave that stuff there until I'm ready to dismiss, dissect, or disseminate. Still, I don't like having to take a lot of time out of my day to get the information I need the way I demand it. This is why my newsfeed and algorithm have been so important. For me, it's click, click, scroll, click, read, share, or create content on that. Having to do too much slows down that process and clogs my creative pipes. Today, I get multiple wrestling stories fed to me whether I like it or not. I'm not sure how long it's going to take of online wrestling abstinence before I start seeing light at the end of my socio-cultural tunnel. What I do know is what I've learned through this experience is vital to understanding how the political cultism over the last several decades works. For example, this thing that I wasn't at all into a year ago has completely engulfed my online life in less than eight months. And that's just pro wrestling. My TikTok feed has been oddly excluded from that, despite me tipping my toe in professional wrestling's algorithmic waters with several videos here and there. However, everything else is giving me wrestling news. Wrestling this, wrestling that. It's harder and harder to find the things that aren't wrestling news. Look, if it's more than a tenth of my news feed, it's an issue because it's wrestling. Something like that becoming more than, say, 5 or 10% of someone's personality becomes obnoxious. Think of the profile. <clears throat> I'm an actor, voice artist, husband, father, left-leaning activist, author, wrestling fan. This is the thing about cultism we forget. That's where this episode is pertinent. But the wrestling is interchangeable with anything from car brands to shoe brands to brands of other brands and even branded ideas. It's all marketing and branding and sales. We're being sold in our algorithms, but we just simply don't think about how or why or who might be selling us those ideas. We repeat the catchphrases. We regurgitate the ideas. We share the memes. We, I, I've heard this show was really good when we didn't hear anything. We saw an ad that had a quote from a paid for review or just a catchy, flashy appearance. And we were tricked into believing it was the next big thing because we were told it was and nobody wants to get left behind. I've always gotten left behind. For some reason, maybe because I'm not cool, I, I escape most trends. So I just get to watch them come and go and observe how people change and how these trends envelop their personalities, personas, and perspectives. With what we've seen in just my experience, with a passing interest in a mostly research on a single topic, having completely consumed my news feeds and changed the DNA of my algorithm, imagine if it wasn't something silly like professional wrestling. Imagine if it was something like, say, social issues or a polarizing political figure. Imagine if we took a vested interest in a particular topic and read, say, three, four, five articles on it. How many more related articles would pop up? Given that, one could see how easy it might be to manipulate the masses. The plain and simple fact is, we are beholden to our algorithm. This is a non-consensual, yet pretty all-encompassing relationship. The thing is, you don't own it. You contribute to it daily, with every click or voice command. You pay into it. You build it. However, it's not yours. As I mentioned in previous episodes, this information is traded, sold, and bartered among corporate America for whatever reasons and means you agreed to in the terms of service you didn't read. We spend years cultivating this mysterious, enigmatic algorithm, which basically dictates what we buy, what we feel, what we think, what we like everything we consume. Don't say it doesn't affect you at all. Come on, we're being honest here. This is your safe space. How many times have you searched for something and then for weeks, even after you purchased the item, you're fed ads for said item? How many times have you mentioned something in verbal conversation? near your phone, and then seen ads for the thing popping up in every website you click on. Now, understanding the internet and SEO and ads and how all that stuff works helps make it a little less creepy for me, but honestly, not a whole lot. The fact is, they very much are watching, or whomever they are, and we allow them to. Your customized coupons, deliberately designed and delivered discounts, and personalized pitches are all tied to your digital fingerprint and data profile. Oh, 
What's this? Look, it's an app where I can scan my face to look younger, older, heavier, skinnier, different hairstyle, different race, facial features, facial hair, outfits. What if I was a different gender? I'm sure this AI isn't scanning our faces, logging all that for someone so that one day we can all be cataloged or worse yet identified for malicious means. I'm sure AI isn't listening to us, learning how we communicate and won't prank call us one day. Yeah, you can't hide after those trends. Every which way you had to hide is compromised completely. All those social media surveys to see which golden girl you are. We're always Blanche, we're whores, but just accept it. But we click, click, click for the happy brain sauce, but we never stop to consider who knows our first dog's name. I discussed this as it pertains to our privacy rights and financial exploitation in previous episodes. This is about the potential for that digital fingerprint and data profile to be manipulated either by malicious motives or our own daftness. In my case, I sort of acted like I was into wrestling more than I am. It's nonsensical background action, and I don't have to actively pay attention unless I want to. It's not distracting because I'm not all that into following it. However, as a performer, I am interested enough in the entertainment performance aspect and the stage combat aspects that it's captivating when I do glance up from whatever it is I am doing. Acting like I'm a fan of wrestling allowed me to explore a phenomenon we see a great deal of in political cultism. However, I didn't want this experiment clouded with anything tied to my core values. I wanted to see something passive, frivolous, superficial, how something as, well, professional wrestling, how that might play out. Something so disconnected from me, I'd noticed the shift. I gradually increased my activity in the cult, if you will, of professional wrestling. I waited and added in music and YouTube, podcasts, and more, and more, and more articles to mimic the actual progression of someone discovering a new idea or a slightly familiar idea, as with me and wrestling, and getting more and more involved, but at a pace more comparable to the cultism of political personality. Many of us saw people over the years that we once respected and looked up to falling prey to a predatory pandering of bully rhetoric. This show is about answering how that happened. It wasn't an overnight phenomenon. They had been building to this for some time. Through the algorithm method. And a phenomenon I'll discuss in a bit called audience capture. When someone hints that they lean a certain way, clicking on articles from certain sources, and that person clicks a few more articles and then listens to a podcast related to that, then looks up some music that aligns with that ideology or from artists who are known to be loyal to that ideology, then that person is watching and consuming more and more and more of those particular kinds of content and ideas. Fewer contrasting ideas are offered, only so much room on the attention plate for the ADD mass media buffet after all. Friends, today I have to go search for my news like this was 2007. It's almost offensive to my technological core. However, I've done this to myself. So much of what I'm fed now is professional wrestling. So much of what I have conveniently in my news apps and notifications is wrestling or fight sport related. It's become the low-hanging informational fruit. It took less than six months to completely blanket my online profile with the cultism of wrestling sports entertainment. Imagine how quickly it would have come if it was politically slanted, not a niche but something so all-encompassing of almost every aspect of our values and social lives. Wrestling is for entertainment purposes only, yet fill in the blank with literally anything other than wrestling, and the result is the same. It isn't about wrestling. It's about how this digital space we're all contributing to manipulates us and redirects our attention, while we just take for granted there isn't a wizard behind the curtain pulling all those strings, literal or figurative. I'm educated and experienced in a lot of the areas related to this. I could see this coming. I did a lot of this deliberately. I still couldn't withstand the onslaught and force feeding of cultism like a caged goose gagging while his foie gets grawed. Taking one little hint of interest in something can easily turn into a full-blown cultism in months, causing our entire personalities and perspectives to be skewed in a direction we never intended. That's without the internet, people. Add that in, and it's exponentially more catastrophic. 
I've been aware of mine the entire time, this time. But this experience has revealed to me the many times over the years, even before the internet, when I allowed myself to be consumed by someone else's ideas, trends, or fads. In the age of the algorithm, our worldview and experience is filtered through the digital virtual world, but we don't control the filter settings. Creating a cyclical loop, feeding itself, regurgitating back the same ideas into the search bar and feeding on that some more, an endless stream of more of what it thinks you want with little of what you need. Those algorithmic filter settings are determined more by our unnuanced actions online without our direct input than carried into infinity and beyond by the mysterious and enigmatic algorithm method. Well, let's just hope that works well enough and we don't end up with any... Uh, unwanted surprises with forever consequences. Why are we like this? How did we get here? The dumbing down and numbing down of society and the full-on embrace of toxic white Southern culture. I hate to say it's all wrestling's fault. Vince McMahon shoulders a lot of the cultural blame here, but in the digital age, our own personal responsibility aside, the algorithm our digital profile is the culprit. Now, take that algorithm phenomenon and filter that through the lenses of tabloids, kayfabe, the sacred fourth wall, and the age of the anti-hero, and it's easy to see the dumbing down and numbing down of our society. I'd like to discuss briefly the principle of audience capture. As an entertainer with a specific social media following, this impacts me personally. My TikTok platform, and in fact, all my platforms, offer a left-leaning socio-cultural and political perspective. Overthinking everything is more cerebral and narrative, long form for the academic and audiobook audience. While my live streams are more interactive, improvisational, my TikToks are a little more sharp, pointed, and hopefully funny. In everything I do, I try to stay authentic to some aspect of myself. However, Pushing much else beyond politically themed content is difficult since my audience has come to expect political and philosophical content. Me posting silly cat videos wouldn't land, even though cat videos would be authentic to my personality. It's difficult to get much traction with acting or voiceover related content, and I'm far more successful in those fields than politics. I do politically themed content because it's important and needs to be done. I say what I say because I don't hear people saying it especially not the way I'll say it. Not that I believe I'm important, but I believe my perspective is more important than silence. I am an actor and voiceover artist. I am an author. I am a lot of things. But while those are passions, the bigger topics I discuss, critical thinking, compassion, ethics, corruption, morality, pragmatism, just to name a few, those are more important to me than other topics at this time. Audience capture is where the content creator creates content people like, so people like, follow, and inter interact with that content. Then that content creator is almost trapped in a prison of their own design, forced to continue down that path, giving the audience more of what they appear to want. Social media personalities don't often shift directions mid-15 minutes of fame. A, there isn't that much time before we fizzle into obscurity, and two, once you've built a platform, chucking that to the wind and starting over to do cooking videos might proved to be a turnoff from how many of your devoted followers. Applying audience capture theory to our algorithms with the algorithm reading what we are telling it we want to see and then the algorithm over delivering, we start to become almost a caricature of ourselves with enormous chunks of our personalities, personas, and perspectives devoted to John Deere tractors, Starbucks, or some other brand of someone else's immeasurable wealth. When audience capture is applied to the algorithm, we can see how easily it can get corrupted without any outside malicious influence. The algorithm just gets greedy, knows no nuance, and takes nothing into consideration except feeding you more so you will feed it more. We've heard the phrase, low-hanging fruit. I used it earlier. It means to grab for the easiest thing. You're not reaching any higher than you have to. You're just barely trying. In fact, that low-hanging fruit often ripens faster. It gets the nutrients faster, closer to the ground, whatever. So it's likely already pretty close to just falling into your hand. You don't even have to pull it. <laughs> Hell, some of that low-hanging fruit's on the ground. 
like little crab apples, bad jokes, the obvious punchlines, or even those jokes that sort of veer into toxic waters are the low-hanging fruit. Sure, you can mock somebody's appearance, but there's more there to mock, or they're not mock-worthy. Mockery for the sake of things that someone can't really help or shouldn't have to justify to anyone else are the low-hanging fruit in a debate or argument. It's easier to go on the low there it is to formulate an actual argument. For that, we think tabloids and paparazzi culture. We've dehumanized celebrities, role models, for years, allowing their lives to be an open book in the checkout aisle just because they chose to do a job. We've allowed the most outlandish claims to be thrown out there by publications that aren't journalism and never really claimed to be. Then Rupert Murdoch got into the tabloid game. Then Rupert Murdoch got into the news and information game. Then Rupert Murdoch got into the entertainment game. Then, with the help of reality television and the deregulation of media, the toxic waste of kayfabe spread throughout our culture. Tabloids were the great fantasy distraction from what we're about to spend in groceries. If we can't wait to read when we get home, find out what the big headline was, we won't bark at the total. Kayfabe's insistence on defending the fabricated reality to the end took tabloid media to news and changed the question from, what if this was true, to, this is probably true. Now, that probably word was enough to condition most to just take their word for it, whomever the source. It was low-hanging fruit, easier to just take that off the ground than reach a few branches up, worms notwithstanding, or with crawling. When you extend that into the political spectrum of post-Palin republicanism, it's clear to see the Donald Trump phenomenon in full display. Tabloids, kayfabe, the breaking of the fourth wall, and the anti-hero. When our reality is attacked to the point where we can't differentiate fact from fantasy, credentials from conjecture, and it's insisted that what we're seeing is the realest reality we could really realistically reality, and that what we aren't able to differentiate between fact and fantasy is held to no true standard whatsoever. It's up to them to report and you to decide if it's true or not. Then our standards for excellence, leadership, and authority are lowered to the point that we, everybody has some skeletons in their closet or nobody's perfect ourselves into swearing over every value we profess to possess and bend the knee to corrupt antiheroes. As I discussed in previous episodes, the age of the antihero began in the 90s. Before that, your anti-heroes weren't heroes at all. They were just the main characters of the show. Archie Bunker and George Jefferson were the same. They were written that way so to show that bigotry, bias, and prejudice go both ways. Hate and ignorance know no color. To some point, they were written with likable and redeemable human qualities, but for most of the episode or the series run, they were the characters the moral lessons revolved around. Edith or Wheezy, or more likely the kids, would set them straight and show, at least the audience, how to handle the wrong thing. Archie Bunker wasn't the hero. He wasn't saving the day. It was a show about people, fictional, but relatable. J.R. Ewing wasn't an anti-hero. He was the villain. Liking him wasn't redeemable any more than liking Darth Vader. I'm going to posit that if you're drawn to the dark characters, you need to ask yourself why. But in the late 90s, the anti-hero emerged as The Sopranos launched into full pop culture infamy. Sure, many shows before when films toyed with the idea of a flawed hero or a complicated main character. However, America began to see, thanks to Vince McMahon, that people would embrace someone other than Hulk Hogan if you offered it to them. That option was offered in the early 90s when The Undertaker hit the scene. We went dark and supernatural. The crowd started to cheer for the bad guy more than the good guy. Hollywood saw, Hulk Hogan saw, and became Hollywood. Bill Clinton was disgraced, but well-liked. A flawed hero, or for many, an anti-hero. Either way, our standards of good and bad in our pick-a-pen culture got lowered, and the lines between right and wrong got as thin as the veil of the fourth wall. Now examining Donald Trump, through the perspective of everything I've mentioned, should reveal more answers as to how this happened. Trump was tabloid fodder, low-hanging fruit. Trump's saturation into our pop culture violated that fourth wall 
and the kayfabe, the lies he sold as reality, combined with America's full embrace of that flawed, nobody's perfect, anti-hero ideal, allowed them to compromise every single value, moral and ethical standard to vote for the worst man in the history of the game. And that's saying a lot for American politics. We relate to the anti-hero subconsciously because nobody's perfect. And deep down, we're fully aware of our own flaws and shortcomings that we won't admit. So rather than rising above, being better, growing and evolving, confronting the uncomfortable, we begin to seek out role models and icons who fit our new lowered standard rather than holding to the old standards for whom we look up to. Much of that is the unspoken realization that even those who groomed and indoctrinated us with those old standards couldn't come close to meeting those standards. Corruption, but through the lens of feelings over facts. We pick the low-hanging fruit of the cult of personality. We pick the low-hanging fruit of the cult of personality orchard. And the more of that low-hanging fruit you pick, the less you desire to even try to reach for the stuff higher up. Now, between the tabloid effect of the corruption of the infotainment industry, the slow spread of kayfabe, the dissolution of the fourth wall, and our lean into anti-hero idol worship culture, we're seeing clearly that this is about a lot of things. Pride, willful, if not prideful ignorance, along with the Nixonian and Bulwaristic rhetoric we've heard for 75 years. But when all of that is brought online into our digital spaces, what do we know from this episode? The more you click, the more you see of whatever you click. And as many Americans clicked, they careened closer and closer off the cliff of cultism, like lemmings, following their algorithms wherever it would lead them, with little to no regard for who was behind the algorithm or who might have a vested interest in tweaking or controlling that algorithm. In this day and age of low-hanging fruit culture, maybe those who have influence over how our algorithms and digital footprints are handled should take more precautions to ensure that we, the people, aren't being taken advantage of. What do we know now? Most people aren't going to do the work. Most people aren't going to do the work to know. They're just going to insist they're right. And we're wrong for trying to prove them wrong. We can agree to disagree doesn't apply to facts, folks. But when the facts are forsaken, for the blind bias of our particular cultism. And our algorithms push more sensationalized opinion the more we click on it. It goes back to my buffet analogy. But it isn't so much that you are going to the buffet and not loading up your plate with the fresh veggies. It's that the buffet delivers a fully loaded plate of the stuff you want without any regard for the stuff you need to balance that out. Well, the stuff it thinks you want based on whatever mood you might have been in at any given moment, of course. We're kids, after all. If all we're fed is candy, who the hell is reaching for a salad? They never had a chance. Without the education, compassion, critical thinking, and perspective of a world greater than them, they crawled into their holes protecting their precious traditionalism, with little desire to introduce new ideas, much less scrutinize them. Then along comes the white van of misinformation and some trench-coated creeper dangling a promise of a payday, Snickers aside, warning that the other wants to abort little baby Ruth, trying to convince you that white chocolate is actually chocolate and better than actual chocolate. It's no wonder they collectively crammed like a clown car into that creepy candy van. Eventually, when all the headlines and all the notifications are saying the same thing and leading you down a path of thinking, who are we, after all, to question the almighty algorithm method? The candy van can cause it mixes it with lies and makes the news taste good. The candy van can, and we the people said they... Coming up, since we've been on the topic of Nixon, Reagan, the war on drugs, and America's problematic past with people of color, 
and the cultural brainwashing of pop culture, I think it's high time we ask ourselves some hard questions and confront the uncomfortable. In the next episode, we'll explore why every town in America has the same police force. Why does every state in America have the same state troopers? The costumes are the same, the cars are the same, the gear is the same, but we're all supposed to just believe America's police force isn't our National Guard, our well-regulated militia, militarized for what? Against whom? Because I've seen firsthand it isn't against fascists or Nazis. Domestic terrorists get to go home. Cops kind of let them do whatever they want in America. Free speech and all. Why do we allow our police to even exist? I'm not talking about defund the police, which is just more terrible branding from the left. I'm talking about why do we allow the police to exist at all? We don't need them. Most don't want them. We just live in fear, so we keep them. Oh, correction. We are made to live in fear, so we keep them out of fear. But is that a fear of what would happen without the police? Are we scared of anarchy, chaos, crime, riots, and the purge? Or is that a fear we all have a fear of the police. Now, that's an experiment America's never tested. In the black and white of Back the Blue, I'm examining America's problematic past with policing and why we the people view our law enforcement more as calm constables or corrupt cops, brave or bumbling, kind public servants or cold-blooded killers. Besides Nixon, Reagan, and the white supremacy behind law and order, where do our ideas of police and the role they should play in our communities come from? One of the greatest shows ever made in the history of television. Until 1965, of course, when color became the biggest issue Americans faced. Of course, I mean buying a new color television. So, step out on the porch and sit a spell with me, won't you? while I break out my southern twang and spin y'all a yarn about how America got gaslit, manipulated, and brainwashed into believing the police are here to protect and serve we the people. <laughs> oh, we all know that ain't the case now. Don't be silly. And don't fret none. I'm going to tell y'all all why and how this happened to us as I'm deconstructing a culture of cultism. <laughs> Thanks for joining me. My new book, Overthinking Everything About You, a Compassion and Critical Thinking Workbook, is on Amazon right now. I believe in this book. I think it can help you. And moreover, I think it can help as a gift for somebody that you think might be struggling with those concepts. Check it out on Amazon or link up to my website at joshbrandonmedia.com. On my website, you're going to find an email list. I've got more books coming out over the next year and a half. So please sign up for my email list. I've got workshops. And I've got so many things I'm working on. I want you to be a part of. Like, share, and subscribe to this video. Go to my YouTube if you haven't already. I've got all my videos arranged in playlists for you. My original music. I've got all of the clips from my acting and voiceover career, all of Overthinking Everything, my TikToks. It's all there for you on YouTube. Thank you wherever you're listening to this from. And if you would, like, share, and subscribe to this podcast and just follow me everywhere you can. Where I grow, you grow. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for being a part of what I've got going on. Hit me up on Cash App too. This is kind of my full-time job. I'm Josh Brandon, and I'm overthinking everything. <laughs>